top proteins. We're going to start amino acid chemistry. We're going to build them via peptide bonds, and then we're going to discuss folding, the levels of structure, and then this is an easy segue on to enzymes and the behavior of enzymes. So, exciting stuff. The central dogma of biology is our information flows from DNA to RNA to the protein. So we go from DNA to RNA protein. Proteins are going to be the outward expression of the genes in DNA. So this is how our information flows. Let's talk about the genetic code. We have a genetic code, A, C, T, G. That's going to be the alphabet of the genetic code. We're going to assemble the words into letters each. So they're, it's a complete, it's an alphabet, and our complete vocabulary is going to be our three-letter word. Now these three-letter words are going to encode for the 20 amino acids. Now obviously it's going to be redundant and I'll save that for a biology lecture. For now let's look at what we call codons of DNA. We go from DNA to RNA to an amino acid in, a, in these little three letter codes that we call codon and they're going to be very specific for which amino acid is next in the chain. So if we look at the chart we can see that some of them are going to have more than one code because we have that wobble hypothesis again another class. You can look at the code and say AUG that is going to be the codon for methionine which is the start codon. It tells the mRNA this is where I start so this is the first amino acid that the tRNA brings to the uh, this is another lecture, so this is not what we're talking about now. So each amino acid is going to be coded for in one of these, uh, one or more of these codons. I want my acid yeah, yeah, yeah. If we look at our building blocks of proteins, we're going to see that they have a very standard form. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. We'll discuss their structure in just a second. Amino acids, they're going to differ by the following. Polarity, some are going to be polar, some will be nonpolar. Within the polar groups, we're going to have charged and uncharged. They're going to vary via size. We're going to have tiny glycine and huge tryptophan. Their shape, some of them, such as proline, make a cyclic structure that can also influence shape of the protein. Charge. If they have a charge, then they are going to be participating in electrostatic repulsions or electrostatic attractions. Hydrophobicity, if we have hydrophobic chains on these amino acids, then these hydrophobic chains will want to stick together and away from the hydrophilic environment. So most of the time, the hydrophobic chain, they're going to fold into the core of the protein or they might be interfacing the hydrophobic lipids of a plasma membrane. We have aromatic. Aromatics. Aromatics are going to be important to imparting UV properties that we'll discuss. Phenylalanine, tryptophan, and tyrosine. These aromatic side chains will absorb UV light, and we can use this in the lab to detect protein samples. Most of the side chains, the R groups, the variable R groups, are going to be linked via a single bond, so their rotation will actually affect the 3D folding in the functional protein and most importantly their position in the sequence because structure is going to equal the function and the structure is going to start with this linear sequence of amino acids. Some general properties of amino acids, of course they can join to form proteins via peptide bonds that we'll cover. They all have an acid and a base. The alpha carbon not only has an amine group but it also has a carboxylic acid group. It also has two additional groups, a hydrogen and a variable R group. The side chain, which is the R group, is going to identify the amino acid. It's going to provide it its function and how it acts in a protein. They all have variations in what part of the structure is protonated depending on the pH of the solution and the structure of the rest of the molecule depending upon the R group. They all, except for glycine that just has a hydrogen group as a variable R group, have a chiral nature. So this is going to also influence the reactions that the compound undergoes. Now, amino acids are positive and negative. They have what is called a Zwitter ion formation. So the presence of both the acid and base, the base being the amine, in the same molecule leads to an interaction between the two. This interaction is going to be a transfer of a hydrogen ion from the acid portion to the base portion of the molecule. The amino acid with both positive and negative regions is called a Zwitter ion. The net charge of this Zwitter ion is zero. This leaves the acid end of the amino acid with a negative charge and a positive charge at the base end. The deprotonated portion 
which is the portion that lost the hydrogen ion, is a carboxylate group, and the protonated group, the one that gained the hydrogen, is an ammonium group. So the presence of a charge on the amino acid makes them water-soluble. Remember, they're going to be polar. Polars like polar compounds, and then, of course, nonpolars don't like polars. The unionized amino acid molecule does not actually exist. It's going to be in the body as a Zwitter ion. If you see it written not as a Zwitter ion, just know that that's not how it is in the body. All right, so we have two, we have two stereoisomers of the chiral amino acids. We have a D form and an L form. And this is going to be how the uh, amine group is situated around the alpha carbon. But what's important to know is that the, the L isomer is going to be the one that is biologically active. It's the one that we're going to find in our proteins. And this is going to be constant throughout all living organisms, which is pretty awesome. Because of their acid-base nature, they're going to be dependent upon the pH of the solution that they're found, which is typically going to be physiological pH. Um, let's talk about different pHs and what, what would occur. Let's look at some of the implication of, of the pH dependency. The Zwitter ion is going to be the predominant form at a particular pH, which is designated the isoelectric point, or we can call it the pi. The isoelectric point is midway between the two different pKa values. pKa is the negative log of the Ka value. Under most physiological conditions, isolated amino acids are going to exist in their Zwitter ion form. At a pH below the isoelectric point, some of the carboxylate groups will be protonated. The pH required to cause this protonation of the carboxylate group depends upon the Ka of the acid. For this reason, the pKa of the carboxylic acid group is important. Typical values are between 1 and 3. If, for example, the pKa is 2.5, at a pH of 2.5, then you would expect 50% of the carboxylic groups to be protonated. The net charge of the protonated form is plus 1. At a pH above the isoelectric point, some of the ammonium groups will be deprotonated. The pH required to cause this deprotonation of the ammonium group depends on the Ka of the ammonium group. For this reason, the pKa of the ammonium group is important. Typical values are going to be between 8 and 11. If, for example, the pKa is 10, at a pH of 10, we would expect 50% of the ammonium groups to be deprotonated. Some of the side chains in some of the amino acids are going to be acidic or basic. In these cases, an additional pKa becomes significant in the reactions of these molecules. This is obviously going to be complicating the pH behavior of the amino acid. Those amino acids that have an additional pKa for their R group are arginine, aspartic acid, cysteine, glutamic acid, histidine, lysine, and tyrosine. So those are going to be those amino acids that have a third pKa. With glycine, since it only has two pKa values, the pK1 and pK2, it will be the midway point in between. This one is easy. For lysine, we have a pK1 and a pK2 for the alpha carboxyl and alpha amine. Now we're adding a pKr for the NH3 group. And so now we have three pKa values. The task is to find which two will give you the isoelectric point, which is electrically neutral. The pK1 of lysine is going to be a positive 2 charge. The pKr is a positive 1, and then the pK2 is going to be a negative 1. So I'm going to select the pK2 and pKr to give me the electrically neutral pI. Let's look at the titration of an amino acid. Let's start off easy with alanine, which is part of the hydrophobic amino acids. And so it's going to have two pKa's. It has one for the carbox group, one for the amine group. And so if we look at this, it's pH by the or sodium hydroxide units equivalents added. And so as we add the strong base, it's obviously going to increase the pH. So as our pH increases is what we're looking at the amino acid. How does it change? The pK1, the alpha carboxyl group, is going to be 2.34. Then we know at that point we're going to have half in the cationic form, or the plus one form, and then half of them are going to be Zwitter ions. It's going to be at a pK1 of 2.34. Then we have the pK2, which is going to be for the amine group, and this is at 9.69. So at 9.69, again, we're going to have half of them in the Zwitter ion form, and then half of them in the anionic form. 
Let's add another term, isoelectric point, or you can see here in the middle of the graph, the PI. That is simply both pKa's, pK1 plus pK2 divided by two, so you're taking the midway point between them, and that is gonna be called the isoelectric point. In the case of alanine, it's gonna be a pH of 6.02. At the isoelectric point, free amino acid is gonna be electrically neutral, at the PI. Now histidine has an amidazole group that has a pKa of 6, so it is readily going to participate in biochemical reactions. The nitrogen on the R chain is going to be donating and accepting protons, so we're going to be able to use histidine in a lot of biochemical reactions. So let's look at the histidine titration curve. Curve we have a pK1 and a pK2. Those are the alpha hydroxyl and alpha amine pKa's that all amino acids have. We're adding the pKr. If we look at it on this graph. We see that there are three plateaus where we have pKa values. And so this can act as a buffer in three different ranges. And as you see, the pKr is close to physiological pH. So we will be using that in biochemical reactions to donate and accept some protons. Okay, let's talk about creating a peptide bond and making a dipeptide. If we have two amino acids, when we put them together, we're making a covalent bond. We're going to call this bond a peptide bond. Peptide bonds are going to join the amino acid units to make a peptide. First, we have a dipeptide, which has two peptides. Then we have a tripeptide. Then beyond that, we're just going to call it a polypeptide. A peptide bond is an amide bond. It is between the alpha carboxyl group of one amino acid and the alpha amino group of the next. The single bond oxygen is going to bind with two hydrogens from the amine group of the second amino acid and we're going to lose it as water. So this is a dehydration synthesis reaction. We lose water every time we make a peptide bond. So we are bonding the alpha carboxyl of amino acid 1 to the alpha amine group of amino acid 2. And you see the R groups, how they're going to situate themselves on either side of the bond. If we look at a polypeptide chain, you're going to see N is always going to be at the um, terminal end where it, you know we read it this direction from left to right. So we're going to have N C alpha C, and that's within its own amino acid, N C alpha C. This alpha carboxyl is, is going to bond to the next amine group and so on. So we have N C alpha C, N C alpha C, N C alpha C, and so on. Okay, so we have four atoms in this peptide bond. The two carbons in this peptide bond are within this peptide bond plane are gonna have about 120 degree angles about the C and the N. And so to account for this geometry, we're going to draw it as resonant structures, if you remember that from organic chemistry. And if you don't, it doesn't matter. I mean, just know that these resonant structures are going to prohibit movement around this peptide bond. So in a polypeptide chain, we're not going to have any movement between the two amino acids at the peptide bond. But the other parts of the chain can move around. So that's going to contribute to protein structure. You can write the polypeptide chain in a shorthand with the N terminus, you can use the actual letter symbols for each of the amino acids or the three letter code, or you can even write out the amino acid name. That's kind of a waste of time. Number them on up to, you know, however long your chain is and make predictions about how the protein will fold in later levels. Next time we will discuss the 20 amino acids and the bonds they make and their behavior in a protein. And then in part three, we will discuss the four levels of protein structure, ending with myoglobin and hemoglobin, oxygen saturation curves, and hey, the four effects. This is Brenda, the not-so-good witch, signing off for today. See you next time on Dr. Bond Science Theater.